Uh, yeah, so I, I made the joke for a service, and I, why, why change it? Uh, that is quite a slide to jump to from the offering slide, just right in your face with it. But uh, we're going to be continuing. Uh, last year, when Ben would have me come in and speak, uh, I was going through the Sermon on the Mount. And we made it through Matthew chapter 5, which is a third of the sermon. Um, and so <clears throat> maybe by the end of this year, we can make it through Matthew 6. Who knows? Uh, and so that said, if you would, if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 6, that is where we are going to be this morning. Um, and as you do, I just want to share a little bit of like a recap of, of what's going on where we're at. And so if you've been here when I've preached last year, pretty much, you've heard me say it already, the, the spiel about the Sermon on the Mount. But we need it because it's going to help us focus on where we are at and where Jesus is at in his setting. So uh, the first thing that we need to remember is that this sermon was given in one go. So it's not like what we do where we come to church and we sit and we're like, oh, and next week's part two. So I'm going to go to lunch and go about my week and then come back next Sunday for part two. Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount in one go to, on a hillside to a group of people. It's the same group gathered. Uh, they didn't go and then, oh, man, I'm not going to be there this week. So I'm not, I'm not going to hear uh, what Jesus said. What did he say last week? It was in one setting. Uh, and it was to a group of gathered misfits. These are the, the poor, the needy, the sick, um, those who have been told, hey, there's not really a place for you in this religious setting. Like, y'all need to go somewhere else. That's who Jesus is talking to on this hillside. It's, it's the, for lack of a better term, the weirdos. Uh, and in the first portion of his sermon, Jesus identifies that members of the kingdom of God, because that's what he's talking about. He's talking about this kingdom. Uh, that members of the kingdom of God are those who, through Jesus, have been made righteous before God. Uh, that, that, that is who members of this kingdom are. And, and they can live out a fulfilled law through the life of Jesus. So when they put their faith in Jesus, that, that fulfilled law, gets it, it, it's, their righteousness is applied to them. And he told them uh, that their righteousness needs to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. So in their day, when someone's thinking about, well, what does a righteous person look like? In their brains, they would have said, ah, it's the scribes and Pharisees. Like, these are the most righteous looking people around. When everybody thinks of what is righteousness, that's who they have in their brain. And Jesus told them, your righteousness needs to exceed them. And so you have this group of people who have probably religiously been told, hey, there's not really a place for you here. And they're going, well, how do I do that? Um, and, and we looked at that. And Jesus goes one step further and he says that kingdom citizens, those changed by Jesus, they're called to be perfect as their heavenly father is perfect. And, and both of those are, are big tasks. And, and we said that these changes and these, these charges to, to have a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and Pharisees and to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Those are only things that a person can do through the work of Jesus Christ. And, and apart from that, there isn't a hope at achieving those things or even attempting them. And, and honestly, like, that, that would preach. Like, we, we could just be done with that. Um, and I think a lot of the people who were gathered on that hillside, they heard Jesus say this. He, he finishes in our Bibles, what is Matthew chapter 5? He says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I think a lot of the people gathered... You know, Jesus took a pause and they're like, okay, and now he's done. It's time to go. Um, but he, he did not. He kept talking. And, and we're going to see that this is a little bit different than what maybe they were used to. Uh, because I think a lot of them would have been okay with Jesus stopping there. And that would have been normal for them. For them to have received this charge, y'all need to have righteousness. You need to have this goal. Here is the goal. And they were presented with this. And a lot, of, um, a lot of the teachers in the day, they would be presented with this, and then it would be, okay, now go and do it. Figure it out. And Jesus uh, keeps speaking to draw conclusions, and he does it to give people action. Uh, and so we, because he keeps speaking, we are going to keep reading. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 1, Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, 
when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Uh, and then for the sake of today, we're actually going to jump down to verse 16. We're going to come back to 9 to 15 next week. Verse 16, And when you fast... Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for for who you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. Um, and I just pray that as we reflect on, on a, an aspect of, of your character, your, your fatherhood this week, that it would motivate us to take a look at our own lives uh, and, and maybe um, make changes in our lives in the areas that we need to so that way we may more wholeheartedly draw nearer to you. Thank you so much again for your word. Help us to honor you with our time this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So like I said, unlike many of the teachers that, that these people had normally heard, a lot of times they would give the, the big, here's, here's the goal, here's the thing you need to do, and then they would just leave the people with that. They'd be like, you know, y'all need to practice your righteousness. And then they would like go over here and they'd say, well, why aren't you doing it? And so when Jesus tells them, you know, y'all need to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. I think a lot of these people were used to at that time for it to be done. Like that would have been the last thing that was said. And, and for Jesus to immediately in response to that begin to give practical things to do to begin to practice that, that, that righteousness and that changed life in Jesus. It's different. He's not just leaving them with, well, what do we do now? He, he gives them what is like a template. And it's not an, an exhaustive list of things to do, but it's a general, these are good ideas if you want to begin to do these things. And, and he uses the word practicing. And I want to say real quick that the idea of practicing and living out righteousness based on the righteous position we have in Jesus, we do not become righteous because of the stuff we do. Jesus makes us righteous when we put our faith in him as our savior. The things that we do from there is practicing that righteousness. We have a changed position and now we are to live it out. And that idea of practicing this changed life, for lack of a better term, term that's, that's religion. That's what it is. And, and there's this, this kind of through line with sometimes in Christianity where it's like, well, it, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. And, that, and I get it. That's, that is technically true. It is our relationship with God through Jesus, mediated now to us by the Holy Spirit in our lives. But the way that we practice that relationship and we make it stronger and we draw nearer to God, that is religion. It's okay. Religion is good. It's a tool that we use to help us better draw nearer to God. And so, Jesus is going to go on in this to give us three spiritual practices or, or pieces of religion. These are things that people do. Uh, Jesus doesn't say, hey, like the stuff you do, it's not important. He says, no, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't make you right before God. It is a way that you practice that righteousness. And so he's going to give us three spiritual practices, um, ways to live out religious belief. That's what these are. One, the first focuses on us and the people around us. The second focuses on us and our God. 
And the third focuses in on ourselves and, and what we need to do. And so with them, Jesus is going to give some warnings. And this is why this word is behind me. And the warnings are against hypocrisy. And he gives these warnings because right out of the gate, Jesus wants to talk about how we do the things that we do. Because as with most things in life, how we do them is either more important or just as important than that fact that we are even doing them at all. How we do something is crucial and it's important. Because if we're doing it for the wrong reasons, it might be from a place that is not good. And when we start to talk about hypocrisy, I want to just acknowledge something about uh, this idea. And that is, when you talk to people and you, you have conversations with um, folks, especially folks who are maybe outside the church, you have conversations, you're like, hey, you know, do you go to church? Where do you go to church? And they say, oh, you know, I used to go to church a few years ago, but I haven't really been in a long time. And you say, well, you know, what's up? Why not? And one of the most common responses is, oh, you know, the church is full of hypocrites. I don't want to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. And, and I think that, I, I get it. It's frustrating. And I think sometimes, not always, but sometimes that claim comes from a place of something happened and I do not want to, I don't want to deal with it, so I'm going to come over here and, and maybe put it off. Sometimes. And sometimes that claim comes from a place of, I could see down the line that this was going to get really challenging. Like, parts of who I am were going to be addressed and I might need to change. And I'm just out. Not always, but sometimes that's where that comes from. But either way, when, when Jesus talks about the spiritual life and living out our righteousness and practicing our righteousness, he has no place for hypocrisy. He does not like it. He spends a lot of time, not even just in the Sermon on the Mount, but just in the Gospels in general, speaking against the hypocrisy that he saw at his time. He introduces this new section with just a warning outright against it. And so he says in Matthew 6, 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. When you practice your righteousness, because, again, kingdom people, people changed by Jesus, they need to be practicing this, growing nearer. You don't do it in a way so that way others will see it. You don't perform it to others. Because when you do that, when you are doing a righteous thing, when you're living out your righteous life and you're trying to live out the life, the changed life that Jesus has given you, and you do it as a performance for other people to see, it says that your reward is found in the praise that you get from those people. And it diminishes the reward we would have received through the praise of our Heavenly Father. There's something about the, the credit or the seeking the praise of people that God says, yeah, that's, that's not the goal here. <laughs> uh, and so you, you'll have your reward here on this earth. Jesus is calling his followers and members of a kingdom to, in short, a consistent religious life. One that says, I have been changed by Jesus. I care about the honor and the name of my God. And that is what it's about. And so when I practice my religion, that is what practicing it is about. Nothing else. Or, if you're de in, another way to put it, is your desire, a person's desire to see, to be seen and receive praise for the things that they do and their righteousness is in and of itself an act of unrighteousness. <laughs> it's it's self-appraising. And so in this general statement, Jesus goes on to describe three disciplines. Uh, uh, and he describes the first, giving to the needy, and he says, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, 
and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Um, before I continue, I, I promise this is not a message on giving. Um, and, and Jesus says, when you give to the needy. He does not say, if you give to the needy, or, well, you saw a needy person and you felt bad enough to give to them. Or, well, you know, you were feeling really low, so you thought, I, I could use a real pick-me-up and I think I will give so that way I am, I am feeling better today. It's not what he says. He says, when you give to the needy, he expects the people of the kingdom to be doing this. He just assumes it's happening. Otherwise, he would have said, people of the kingdom, y'all need to be giving to the needy. And when you do so, here's what it looks like. He skips the, the charge to do it and jumps right to how you do it. And a lot of times, I think when we think of giving to the needy, we think of donating money or writing a check to some charitable cause. Uh, and we think of maybe giving someone on the side of the road a $5 bill so they can get some lunch. And while that is an act of giving to the needy, it's much more than that. It's not, it's not just limited to that. First, because the people gathered were Israelite people. They're, they're Jewish Israelite people. And so they would have been acquainted with parts of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, when someone gives to the needy, it's often much more than money. It's usually services provided to them. Food given to them. Loaning of property. When you borrow your neighbor's ox, there's laws about it. Lending aid, like giving someone your time and effort as help. These are all examples of giving to the needy, as well as monetary giving. And while this may be a big part of it, like I said, it's, it's not limited to just money. Also, don't forget that many of those people gathered, they don't have money. <laughs> They're poor. And so for Jesus to say, hey, y'all need to be given to the needy if they're going like, well, wait, that's me. Like, yeah, who's going to give to me? Jesus said, no, 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 no. You still have a way to give to needy people. It's not about how much money they had. Rather, it, it, it's about something that's going on inside them. Because he expects members of the kingdom to be charitable. To be a, a, of charitable character, that means that they, they give out of a charitable heart in the ways that they can. And he tells them, when you give, don't sound your trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues to be praised. And could you guys, like, could you imagine this? Like, we, we put the slide up for offering. We do the prayer of our offering. And then we get ready to go. And somebody stands up in the back row. Like... Toots the horn, and it's like, look, hey, I just gave. If that happened, we would like get down our seats of embarrassment because it's like that's not how this works. Like we we in our in our own lives sense like the ridiculousness of what Jesus has just said. Like it sounds wild. But this was happening. Like these scribes and Pharisees would give, and then they would go, hey, you should see. What I just put in the treasury. It's wild. It's awesome. <laughs> May God be praised. And he tells them, when you give, don't, don't do that. Don't sound your trumpet. Because the hypocrites, they stand in the synagogues, in the streets, and they, they toot their horns, and they want to make sure everybody knows, look how much I gave up. It's attention-seeking. They want attention for themselves. And if that happened, we would be like, what is that guy's deal? No. A couple points that are going to carry on through even past just this spiritual practice. Um, the first is that all of these assumes that the motives of kingdom people, people changed by Jesus, they're not self-aggrandizing. They're not for feel-goodedness. We don't do it to get a warm fuzzy, and we don't do it so that way someone can praise us. That's, that's not the point. Kingdom people ought need no more motivation than God to be honored in what they do. That's it. And so if you're giving to honor yourself or make yourself feel good, and you claim kingdom citizenship and to have been changed by Jesus, it's hypocritical. And I want to note here, Jesus isn't saying, 
and now you're out of the kingdom. No. He says, stop it. <laughs> like, don't do that. You're still changed by Jesus, but now something in your life needs to change too. This word hypocrite, um, it, it, translated, it literally means like one who acts. And it was like when you'd go to a play and someone stands up and they're play acting and they're trying to convince the audience of something that's not real. I am this character. That's the word. And so when he uses it, he's invoking this idea that when people do this, they're trying to play act and trick someone. They're trying to make someone believe something that's not real. They're trying to make the people around them believe something. They're trying to make God believe something about them. And I think most times, they're trying to make themselves believe something that's not real as well. Jesus calls it for what it is. <laughs> these people who did this, and in turn these teachers, that he says, you're hypocrites. It's not that he doesn't love them, but he says, this is not right. Jesus doesn't say, well, since the hypocrites do this, that, and the other, and they're over here in the synagogues, don't go there. Stay as far away from them as you can and run in the other direction. That's not what he says. He says, when you do this, don't be like them, even if they're all around you. Don't let the posers ruin a good thing for you. And while it can be difficult, like I said, to imagine someone standing up in the synagogue or in church even and honking a horn to announce their giving, it's kind of hard to imagine. How often do we toot our own horns to ourselves? Man, I gave, and I hope somebody noticed. I hope somebody noticed it was a little more this week. Man, I... I gave all weekend helping that person. I, re I really hope they appreciate it because, man, it was tough. It's hypocrisy. Jesus says if you look for earthly praise in your giving, you'll have your reward. You'll get it. You'll be praised by those people. And in turn, he says, you will miss out on the reward of the Father. And so we ask, how can we avoid this? And Jesus, he, he does what a good teacher should do. He gives them advice. He gives them an application. What do you do? And what he says is a lifestyle change, which is sometimes the most difficult and challenging of all. He says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing when it gives. And we go like, these things think for themselves now, what's going on? Uh, but it's a turn of phrase. Jesus is calling for real heartfelt charity that is not worried about, well, man, I feel like I should give to this person, or I feel like I should volunteer this. Ah, but, you know, maybe there's something where I could maybe get a little more credit, and maybe somebody else, you know, oh, or this will feel better if I help this person instead. It's a, it's a heart position that cannot be concerned about credit and praise and attention where it just says, yes, absolutely, I'll help you. And this is not like lack of care for the resources God has given us. He's called us to be good stewards. But when we use those resources, it's a heart position of charity that says, I want to help this person for no other reason than that the name of the Lord may be praised in it. Not for my own happiness, not for my own praise, not even to make that person feel good. But so that way they know that I've been changed by a charitable Savior. And I want to extend charity to them in this moment. And so, uh, Jesus continues to address the spiritual practice and hypocrisy. In verse 5, he says, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you pray, go in your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Notice again, Jesus assumes that they're praying. He says, when you pray. Uh, so kingdom people, people changed by Jesus, they're praying people. They're, they're giving people, and they're praying people. 
And he warns them by telling them two things about prayer. First, prayer is not done to seek attention. We do not pray to God so that way we may get attention for the fact that we've prayed. He says, don't do what the hypocrites do. They get right in the middle of the street corner where everybody's going to have to walk. And they, okay. And then they start talking. They get really loud so that way nobody can ignore the fact that they're... He says, stop it. That's not what prayer is about. When we pray, they, they get louder in the, in, in the church, in the synagogue. They start shouting, so that way people will, oh, whoa, that guy, he's praying louder. Jesus says, no, that's not the point. Because like the trumpet tooting of the givers, the shouting of those who pray in this way, the, the attention is for themselves. Jesus corrects this. He says, the person of the kingdom can... And should be able to pray anywhere without anybody knowing about it. A person changed by Jesus, kingdom people, can and should pray anywhere without, should be able to pray anywhere without anyone knowing about it. And I'm not saying that corporate prayer is not good. It, it's good. But we do not pray as a group or as a corporate group of Christians for credit. And so if there is a, a possibility that you are going to be distracted by the fact that, oh man, there's six people in there, I better, I better make sure that my prayer is better than the last guy's. If that is the case, Jesus says you'd be better off shutting yourself in your room to do this. So that way you can focus in on a relationship and a conversation with your Father. That is what prayer is. If you want to talk to God, Jesus says... Do what you need to do to focus on it, to make it real. Don't worry about impressing people. It's not the point. And Jesus has a lot more to say about prayer. We're going to do that next week because it's, it's a lot. Um, because when you're talking to your father, to connect and not to impress people, your reward is found in the father. In that experience. And as we've said at this point, uh, when he says, like, don't heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles. In this point in history, the term Gentiles is referring to all the people who are not the, the Israelite people outside of the people of God. And uh, Jesus doesn't use them as this example because he doesn't like them. Jesus died for the Gentiles. But he's using it because culturally, in their thinking, when you are a person of God, man... What's the weirdest thing that's going on? Oh, the Gentiles over here. Especially the scribes and Pharisees. They did not care for what the Gentiles were about a lot of the times. And Jesus says, if you think the Gentiles are ridiculous because they invent fancy words and they have these long phrases and they do all this wild stuff so that way they can be heard by their gods. Jesus says, listen, if you are praying loudly so that way people will hear you, you're kind of doing the same thing. Like... It's, it, you're cut from the same cloth. And if there's one thing the Pharisees hated more than Jesus calling them hypocrites, it was Jesus equating them to the things that the Gentiles were doing. Because the point is this. God doesn't need you to pray aloud in public to hear you. He doesn't have a hearing problem. And he doesn't care how fancy your words are. He wants you to have a conversation and connect with him a real one he, he does not care how fancy your words are he does not care how long you pray for and if you go back and read the Psalms David gets mad <laughs> and he's praying to God while he's mad our father simply wants to connect with us and, and I don't think there's any coincidence that Jesus has introduced the idea of God as father here because it, it's a relationship. Again, we're back to that. And, and sometimes, when I am talking to my daughter, Sarah, um, she is chattering. Like, and I cannot understand what she's saying. Because she's three. And she gets going, and her brain's going faster than her mouth has figured out how to sometimes. And it's, it's indecipherable to me. And I don't care. Because we're spending time together. We're interacting with each other. 
That's what Jesus is trying to get us to experience and understand with what prayer is. It's us communicating with our Father, even if we're angry. Even if we're saying stuff that the Father's going, okay, you don't get it, but thank you for giving me this experience. He could care less how it sounds. Also, God knows what we need. So this is not a, hey, in case you didn't know. God knows what we need. Our Heavenly Father knows us. He desires us to seek Him, to know Him more, and not our own praise. And so Jesus finishes the call for these spiritual practices and avoiding hypocrisy by telling us, verse 16, When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. He uses the same, same pattern, when you fast, it's expected. Uh, and, and a lot of times in the most common version of a fast in their day, and actually when people think of it today, they think of a, of a dietary fast, a fasting from food or drink. Uh, and... And that is, yes, that is fasting. But it can be much more than that. You, you can fast from all sorts of things. And, and in short, fasting is about, it's an opportunity for us to remove what is one, at one time a distraction. And the important thing here, and I believe more importantly, is to add a time that we then take to focus on our God. And an example is like, if there's people who I believe are better than me, and they, let's say they fast and they give up coffee. I'm not there. Um, they fast from coffee and in the morning you know they would go and they would get their cup of coffee and they would sit and you know start the day with that cup of coffee and when they're fasting from coffee they, they get that cup of coffee and they okay there's no coffee here they don't just go well I'm going to kill 10 minutes now I guess just waiting for what would happen after no it's the time that you would normally be spend doing this thing and thinking about this thing you now spend it reflecting on and spending time with your God you add the spiritual practice. That's what fasting is about. It's about what we do in the place of the thing that we are fasting from. And this, the point is we're supposed to take time with our God to, to grow and discipline ourselves, discipline our lives, to better seek God in the future. And the hypocrites... in Jesus' time, the people who claim and they're like, oh yeah, you know, we've got to fast... Man, they complain about it. Uh, they're loud about it, too. Oh, I'm so hungry. I'm fasting. I haven't had anything but, but juice for seven days. It's really tough, but I'm, you know, I'm fasting. Jesus says, listen, when hypocrites fast, everybody around them knows that they're fasting. When kingdom people, people changed by Jesus, who desire to use that fast as an opportunity to grow closer to their God, when they're fasting, uh, nobody might even know. Jesus says, if you're going to fast, you really want to do it, make people not know about it. He, he says, wash your face, put on a clean shirt. Like, anoint your head, wash your face. I add, put on a clean shirt. <laughs> make it look like Everything's fine. There's nothing different about me today than there was last week. Because it's not about us and the people around us seeing it. It's about us growing in discipline in our spiritual life so that way we can better connect with our God in the future. And Jesus says, if you're going to fast, make it unknown. It's not a hiding. It's just a, nope, they don't need to know about that. This is my life. It says, my interaction with my God. And if you use your fasting for others to say, wow, that guy looks hungry. Uh, or, man, he must be so committed. Like, he's on, he's on day five. Jesus says, you've already received your reward in the praise that you received. You got, you, you got your pat on the back. You've received your reward. But if you make your fasting about growing nearer to the Father, the Father is your reward. That, that growth in that relationship is the reward. And in all three of these spiritual practices, we learn something. Our spiritual practice, the things we do to practice our righteousness, 
they involve our personal lives, things like fasting. They involve us in our relationship with our God, like prayer, we're connecting. And they do involve the people around us. We don't do this in a bubble, like giving. And when we have our motives in check, we're, we're going to find that when we practice our righteousness in a way that focuses on God the Father, Jesus tells us the Father holds our reward. And so you might hear that and you go, well, I want to know more about the reward. Like, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Um, the reward the Father has for us is, is this. If, if the praise of man... Jesus is like, if you've been praised by people for the stuff you're doing, if the praise of man can replace that reward, this is not salvation. He's not, the reward here is not salvation. That's not something that the praise of people can remove from us. They don't have, they don't have that much power. This is the, the, the delight of the Father. If, if receiving all this praise from people can remove it, then, then God's like... You, what do you need my praise for? What do you need my delight for? You're getting enough. And if you hear that and you're like, man, that, that seems like, I, I kind of like the other thing where it's, you know, like I, I get more, more of something or maybe a better spot. <laughs> uh, I would leave you with thinking about this. When a child comes to the knowledge that they have made their parent proud, You, the child is rewarded in knowing that they have made the parent proud. They like it. <laughs> they enjoy it. They're like, yes. Like, Dad said he liked that. Mom told me she was proud of me. They don't go, well, I'm glad you liked it, but like, what, you know, I still don't like this. No. They have a reward in the sense that the parent is pleased with them. That's the image of the Father. When we draw near to the Father and we do it only so that way we may glorify His name, He says, this delights me. And as the Father delights in us, we grow in our delight of the Father. 